will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all righteousness. My friends, let us pray. God, you invite us to ask for living water, water that satisfies our thirst. You are that living water poured out for us. We confess that we seek to quench our thirst in other ways. We drink deeply, choosing these sweet waters that turn to fear in our bodies. We confess that rather than turning to you, we set out to be brave. Seeing the fear outside ourselves, we try to force out fear by casting out others. God, help us to drink deeply of your love, remembering it is the perfect love that casts out fear. Strengthen us to practice love to ourselves, for those close to us, and especially for those we overlook. Fill us with living water until it overflows. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My friends, there is one fact that is true and it never changes. It is this. God has loved us. She loves us still and she will love us always. I declare to you in Jesus' name we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. My friends, would you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is Psalm 63, the first eight verses. This is a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. O God, you are my God. I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands and call on your name. My soul is satisfied as with a rich feast, and my mouth praises you with joyful lips. When I think of you on my bed, and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. My soul clings to you, and your right hand upholds me. Holy wisdom, holy word, thanks be to God. Amen. So it was in the 4th century that Benedict of Nursia appointed this Psalm 63 to be read every Sunday evening as part of evening prayer. This is a practice that we renewed here this past winter during our services of evening prayer. I suspect, at least in part, that Benedict chose this Psalm to remind us that the reason we speak all of our Sunday words and read aloud the Holy Word together is to express our longing for God, our thirsting for first-hand experience of God, to renew our relationship with all that is happening under and behind and beneath all of our words. It's the reason we come to the sanctuary, writes the psalmist. And then it transitions smoothly from our gathered worship to the evening prayer, from daylight to darkness, and finally to the world of dreams, the meditations of our hearts through the night, from our bed, through the watches of the night. The essential longing for God is compared to our need for water in parched places, and the satisfaction of our souls experienced as a sumptuous feast both nicely evoke the sacraments of baptism and communion. So I want to do two things with this brief homily this morning. I want to commend to you an article from last Sunday's New York Times, and I want to ask you a question. The article last Sunday was written by Tish Harrison Warren and appeared under the title, Why Poetry is So Crucial Right Now. 
I posted it on the church's Facebook page this morning so that you can find it easily. Tish Warren is a priest in the Anglican Church of North America, and she opens her piece by describing a conference she attended last summer on poetry geared for Christian leaders. Poetry, she writes, expresses our longing for transcendent reality, for the good, the true, and the beautiful, for those things which somehow lie beyond mere argument. The poet's trained attention to the smallest detail in our created world, or the nuances of our experience, she notes, is something akin to prayer. Poetry can reveal or unveil the world to us, causing us to stop and slow down and see what is going on around us and within us. Poetry helps us see not only the world in exquisite detail. As Hopkins said, the world is charged with the grandeur of God, but also to experience and encounter ourselves. Poetry, like prayer, is not easy. We have to bring all of ourselves to the reading of a poem. All of ourselves, but not our assumptions. Preconceived notions or interpretations of the world get in the way of letting a poem speak to us. Reading poetry is a species of listening, where words point beyond themselves. Hopkins again, what you look hard at seems to look hard at you. Reading and hearing poetry takes work and it takes time. Poems must be read more than once before they reveal their truths. So why is poetry crucial right now? Warren suggested in her piece last week that a particular gift of poetry for our moment is that good poems reclaim the grace and power of words. Words seem ubiquitous right now. We carry worlds, she write, we carry worlds of words with us every moment in our smartphones. We interact with family and friends through the written word in emails, and texts, and Facebook posts. But with our newfound ability to broadcast any words we want at any moment, and I might add from a safe distance, we can cheapen them. I would go further to say that if, as the New Testament letter of James says, our words should be used with care, because they can be used for blessing or for cursing, to do good or to cause harm, then on most days today it feels like the balance sheet falls heavily on cursing and harm. So many of the words we encounter are used to divide, debase, demean, destroy, or diminish others. Words are shouted, posted, sent out into the world in all caps, scrolled as instant reactions or ideology beneath every story. But if Warren writes, in our age of social media, words are often used as weapons, poetry treats words with care. Words are slowly fashioned into lanterns that can illuminate and guide. Debate certainly matters, she adds. Arguments matter. But when the urgent controversies of the day seem like all there is to say about life and death and love and God, poetry reminds us of those mysterious truths that cannot be reduced to linear thought. I commend the article to you. So my question is, do you have a favorite poet? Or a favorite poem? And if not, what is it that renews for you the longing that is found inside our language? Perhaps it comes through music. I'm reminded that Bob Dylan won the Nobel Prize in Literature for his song lyrics. I've got a host of songs that are as deeply meaningful to me as traditional prayers and even some scriptures. Words matter. What restores for you care and attention to the words we use? I've got a few friends with whom I share poetry. Pastor Sarah and I, for example, regularly pass poetry collections back and forth. 
She and I were both trained in pastoral care by a professor who believed that poems today are the closest thing we have to parables, which was Jesus' own chosen form of communication for revealing and unveiling the world within us and around us. Susan DeGeorge just shared with me a religious biography of George Manley Hopkins, which accounts for my quoting him twice in the sermon. When I moved to White Plains 11 years ago, I made a habit of standing in this pulpit at 8.30 every Monday morning to do two things. I would read a published sermon by an accomplished preacher to try out another pastor's words in my mouth. I thought of it as exercise. And I would read a poem. The U.S. poet laureate Robert Pinsky was just then working with Maggie Deeds to bring out several volumes aimed at ordinary readers, including an invitation to poetry, poems to read aloud, and America's favorite poems. This latter volume, which is still here in the pulpit, was selected, a set of poems selected by ordinary folks across the country. But the real power of the collection is that each poem was accompanied by brief notes written by those who had submitted them. Here were the voices of students, prisoners, professors, factory workers, cab drivers, lawyers, authors, artists, activists, designers, teachers, a handyman, a stock boy, a retired priest. Not unlike the saints in the song Patty is going to play following the sermon, I sing a song of the saints of God, where the saints are a doctor, a queen, a shepherdess on the green, a soldier, a priest, and those who were slain. Ordinary folks. For example, above William Ernest Henley's poem Invictus, which I marked long ago, on the dignity of each person, that cannot be diminished by circumstances. We find in this volume the deeply moving words of an optometrist who had experienced the attack on Pearl Harbor, a woman whose life experience landed her in 23 years of the nightmare of prison, who holds, holds on to this poem for inspiration, and a survivor of a stroke that left him confined to home in a chair and recites this poem at night to stave off panic. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbound. I recommend this volume for any of you wishing to connect with poetry, to be guided by these kinds of reflections from ordinary folks. And I do want to hear from you if you have a favorite poem or poet. Because poetry is like prayer. Both poetry and prayer remind us that there is more to say about reality and can be said with our words, though with both we use words to try to glimpse what is beyond our words. And they both make space to name our deepest longings, lamentations, and our loves. Amen.
ushers will come forward at this time so that we may share our gifts, our tithes, and offerings for the good work of Christ's church.
precious, never again taken for granted connection with God and one another. My friends, let us come to the table. Receive the invitation. So often this invitation to communion calls you to come to an altar, a rail, or a table. Mind, heart, spirit, and sometimes body. Today you are reminded of this other truth. Communion always comes to us. We don't make it with our baking or our prayers. God is wildly generous. No one needs to move an inch. So please stay put, wherever and whoever you are, here in the sanctuary, joining us through the screen at home. Communion with God is coming to you. Prepare to welcome your guest. My friends, this is our story. But on the night that Jesus ate for the final time with his friends and companions, he took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he shared it with them, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, it is broken for you. Eat it, remembering me. And in the same manner, following the meal, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he shared it, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood poured out for you and for many forgiveness of sins. Take it and drink, remembering me. And so as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup in this way, remembering Jesus, we do so, announcing his death and resurrection till he come again. Let us pray. We remember so many different tables of Jesus. His acceptance of hospitality from Peter's mother-in-law and Martha. From Simon, so suspicious of sex workers. Zacchaeus, love venture capitalist. And one boy with a small picnic lunch. We remember Jesus learning the reality lesson about who eats on and eats under the tables of the world. From a Syrophoenician woman and is teaching his disciples this same lesson another evening, gently and with foot washing. We remember the Passover meal with a betrayer and a denier present, and everyone scared and confused. Jesus used what was familiar, bread already on the table, a cup from which he had drunk. Always, even today, in the accessible ordinary, anyone can reach the holiest food, and even a single cupped hand can hold this rush of wet blessing. Holy God, bless every bread near the mouth of any one of your children, so that it becomes the strength and hope and holiness each of us needs. Bless the small plastic cup or the beautiful chalice and every glass in between that reminds us that we can never spill your love and we always and in all places drink your healing. We pray for this community, gathered and scattered, in grief, in prayer, in healing. We pray for those loved ones on our minds this morning and lift up our species in their need for healing. And on this Labor Day weekend, we pray for those who labor, 12 hours with little rest and meager pain, whose children are left on their own to fend for themselves, for those who labor without promise of security for tomorrow whose sweat makes our lives comfortable. For those who labor for the rich and are treated without respect, without safety, dignity, without basic rights. God have mercy. Christ have mercy. God have mercy. For those who labor
giver than the king. Lord, hear our prayer as we take refuge in you. So again, we ask, Holy God, that you bless every bread near the mouth of any one of your children, so that it becomes the strength and hope and holiness each of us needs. Bless the small plastic cup and the beautiful chalice and every glass in between that reminds us that we can never spill your love and we always and in all places drink your healing. And so we pray together in the way that Jesus taught, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, come, all is ready. Let us keep the feast. My friends, who hold the bread of heaven. Honor it. It is consecrated to perfectly match your need. Receive it. We eat in hope. Now please take your cup. You hold the cup of blessing. Honor it. It is consecrated so you become one of the saints of communion. Receive this one small sin. Let us pray. O God, we give you thanks that no one table, that, that, that no one is over your table, and no one is under your table. 
but that we all share your love together. We are in the midst of difficult times for all your children. Illness, fire, heat, storm, earthquake, violence. And particular sorrows and griefs and decisions for those we know. We are so grateful that you have brought this communion to us. So we may surround, so that we may surround with its strength and comfort those we know. And search out those we do not know to offer hope and help widely and freely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Redeemer and Sustainer, remain with you now and always. <laughs>